Hello, everyone. Welcome to Peer to Peer Real Estate Show. I'm your host, William Morales. And on today's show, I have Alex Carini. Did I pronounce your last name right, Alex? Better than I ever could. All right, buddy. And Alex has a full service boutique real estate brokerage firm here in New York City. Alex, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on your great show. Well, I appreciate it. So Alex, now Alex and I met at a real estate event early this year, uh, Red in NYC. Uh, you know, I definitely want to thank Selman, you know, because Selman always puts these great events together. So Absolutely. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you, you know, uh, about yourself and your business? Absolutely. So um, I originally got into real estate. I'm from Italy originally, and I came to New York and I saw all these buildings, right? And I was like, I think New York is great for buildings and for real estate. And uh, what I've simply done is tried to match my background in international business and, you know, uh, living in many places and foreign buyers and so on and so forth with what New York is famous for, for this driving business, but in particular real estate, uh, real estate background. And so little by little, I got into the business and then ultimately I, that led me into uh, building and starting my own firm uh, that focuses exactly on that, on New York City real estate um, and a lot of uh, foreign buyers and also domestic buyers. So we'll definitely touch into that. Yeah. So Alex, uh, growing up, did you know you always wanted to be an entrepreneur or as you got older, you, you fell into, let's say, real estate? Did you know you wanted to do real estate when you were like 10 years old? <laughs> that, that is a very good question. And I would tell you, I, it's hard to say, but when, when you're, you know, truthfully speaking, when you're young, you really don't know what you want to do, right? And you're influenced by your family and things. Now, I happen to have a family of entrepreneurs, my father and my mother, and they were actually, especially my mother was in the real estate business as well, uh -huh. okay? Now, at that point, I happened to be someone that wanted to kind of do his own thing, and you know, I grew up in Italy, and so I didn't know I, was gonna, I wanted to be in real estate, but I always wanted, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And real estate kind of happened when, when I moved to New York and I saw, again, everything that happened here. Probably if I would have been in another state, I wouldn't have done this. Uh, but I always had the entrepreneurial bug, you know, yeah. um, doing something, growing something and building a team and being able to hire people. I always liked uh, that aspect of it, creating something. Okay. So when did you start your business? Like, um, you know, the Carini Group or was there something before the Carini Group? Yeah, so I got into the business of real estate uh, about nine years ago. Okay. Even though it feels like it's 39 years <laughs> because it's busy, busy all the time. And initially I was working for a law firm and um, I was doing basically helping with real estate and bringing companies in. So this company will look for a store, especially from Europe, right. you know, top name brands. I was very young and I was very lucky with that. And little by little, I understood that I wanted to do real estate. So initially, I did it within the law firm and helping clients finding spaces and uh, also for personal property, a home where they, where they would be, especially when they moved to New York. And um, finally, I thought, you know, if you want to learn a business and do it well, if you want to know how to make pizza, you have to go and work in a pizza place, right? You have to do it 100%. Exactly. So that's when I went... Um, about eight years ago to, to work for a real estate agency. It was a boutique one with ownership in Italy and, um, and London, okay, in, in Europe. And then after two, three years, I was able to manage the team here, which was small, a small boutique firm, four or five people. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to really learn, you know, and have also the flexibility of being almost an entrepreneur within the company, right? Right. And then... Three years ago is when I started my company. I'm going now my fourth year, even though, again, it seems like much, much longer. And it really happened, you know, organically uh, to the point that most of my clients were asking me, Alex, when you start your company? And, um, and that was, you know, um, was probably a, a smaller jump than from going to a salary position that, uh, to an agent. It was a bigger jump. Sure. And from agent to owner of a company, it's actually a smaller jump. So that's how we started. And now fast forward, you know, um, after these nine years, we are very happy to be one of the leading uh, boutique luxury companies. And we represented many brands like Lamborghini, Dolce & Gabbana, Armani, you know, Cipriani, also New York. Right. So we've been very lucky to find a quick success, so to speak, um, being able to present great brands and also smaller, smaller deals, all of the above. 
So, you know, and touching base on your boutique uh, business, yeah. how did, and how and why did you decide that was the best way to go, that you have such a full coverage of, of services that you provide for your clients? How did you decide that was the best way to go and not outsource everything? Because it seems like you, you keep everything in-house. Yes. Um, I always have a very simple approach to business, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm fascinated by entrepreneurship on all different levels, right? And sometimes when somebody starts a company, they really think, okay, where am I starting from? Right. I always tend to have a practical approach and reverse engineer things from the client, right? So first I think you have to understand who your client is and then because those are the people that are going to pay for the service that you provide, right? right. So because of my European background, um, I started from my client, which were either, you know, investors, for luxury real estate or these brands that I mentioned before that New York landlords love to have yeah. because they're your, the European brands. So then the step number two was how to really leverage those connections and make it into real estate. And I think in, and I tell you, especially in this market, William, where <laughs> I don't even know how to call this market, you know, it's especially this year, you know, everything is going on, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of changes. Having a very practical approach to business has helped us so much because we've seen that the, the companies that are growing organically and either the boutique companies or the very, very large companies are the ones that are able to, to sort of sustain their business. Yeah. The one in between are the ones that either get bought or they're not able to sustain. And, and that's really what, what, what we're seeing. So boutique business for me, is, 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 it's helpful because I can, um, consult moments of a private, you know, wealth uh, level, these clients that want a custom made suit uh, yeah. type of service uh, versus that, you know, going into, into the very large business, uh, which, which in 2020, it, it's almost, you know, very easy for us to compete. Right. And now, and especially, you know, you just touched base 2020. I mean, what the, a, a previous five, six months we've been having, especially with the pandemic, has, has it affected business in any way for you guys? Well, uh, it has. It will be um, not, you know, has affected everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I would tell you, I mean, mainly we were limited in showing properties. Right. Actually, matter of fact, the biggest news of the day today is that finally New York City real estate has opened, meaning you are able to show properties again right. as of today, right? Up until today, you were very limited in how you show properties and so and so on and so forth. Um, but I tell you, the fact that we have a very you know flexible business model and we're light on the overhead, we will be able to. We were faring very well with this pandemic uh, compared to, for example, the peers that I've been talking to. Mm -hmm. And um, I see that for us to pick up new business, for example, it's been much easier than you would think. Wow! Because the way I see it is. Truthfully, a lot of professionals took some time off, right? I, yeah. uh, or maybe they were sitting on the couch, say, say how you want. I, I really think nine of, out of 10 brokers were not working as hard because it's understandable. Yeah. You should do actually the business development activity that you would do before the pandemic. You will find that it's so much easier to pick up now new business because all these owners, they need to do things and they can't find anybody that will do it. Right. And so we actually were able to, to transact on the buy and sell side of the business, residential. Um, also, we cover the rental business when it comes to also residential. Sure. And on the commercial side, I would say is the business uh, um, uh, sector that was affected the most, truthfully speaking, because of, you know, of obvious reasons. Retailers have been having a really hard time. Yeah. Um, Multi-family investing also has, has, been, has been affected really. And on, on, on that end, especially on the retail side, we've been able to consult for them on, for example, negotiating rent, right? right? Because as you know, William, you know, the rent law was very, it doesn't really give some guidance, you know, apart from moratorium on eviction. And, right. You know, but they don't know, okay, Alex, so how much should I pay? Should I pay rent? Should I pay half? Should I pay a third? So we've been very successful in working with attorneys, let's say, on the, on the, on the, on the contractual part. Sure. In negotiating the terms, I mean, sometimes we'll be able to half their rent, not just for temporary, uh, you know, time of pandemics, but 
through the end of the lease. So clients, especially large retailers, were very, very happy with, um, with our services. Oh, that's good. So, you know, I wanted to touch base. Um, so you cover residential and multifamily office space. It, it, do you run the whole gamut when it comes to an, an, uh, your real estate firm? Yeah, so the way we're set up is vertically integrated. I have two companies that I okay. keep separate. One does residential business. Okay. For residential business, I mean buying, selling, and renting of apartments. Okay. Very simply, right? And one does commercial business where we do retail, office, and selling of multifamily mixed use buildings. Okay. Now let's touch base on the right hand, your right hand. <laughs> so commercial, yeah. Right, the commercial side, the retail, um, in your opinion, is retail dying, those mom and pop stores? I'm, I'm telling you, Alex, the other day I was passing by, I was on a bus and I'm going downtown and on Lexington Avenue, I think right. it might be in the 70s or somewhere. I think I counted, and now the bus is going by, I think I counted like seven or eight stores, or let's say retail spaces that were all either closed temporary or pretty much done. Um, what's your take on, on, the, on those retail stores, on the mom and pop, so to speak? I would tell you, William, I think that's the really heart of the question. You know, I think when it comes to residential, it didn't suffer as much, people were paying their rent. But the right. real question is exactly the one that you're asking. Will we see this mom and pop shop ever again, right? right. Even where, where, where I live, for example, I live in Midtown, there's one, a uh, coffee shop that's been here for 124 years. Wow. I walked by three days ago. First time I see, you know, the label on the, on the, on the store saying after 124 oh, no. years. Wow. Years ago. So the way I see this, William, you know, I, I want to tell you exactly what I think. I'm practical. I think the market um, it's right now has to be adjusted. Okay. Mm -hmm. However you look at it. You can't ask rents that you were asking for 2015, 2016, 2017, um, and all throughout the spectrum, meaning tenants, meaning landlords, and meaning banks. Right. right? Now, you know, as the government, you know, supplied some funds to help, you know, uh, level the things as, as they were closed and so on and so forth. But ultimately, when this opens up, the biggest question is how much are we renting spaces now? Is it going right. to be half? Is it going to be three quarters? Right. And so I think that ultimately, for obvious reasons, I mean, you have contracts, right? We have contracts with lot of credit, we have contracts with security deposit, we have contracts that are renegotiated, but the market would ultimately readjust. There's, not, there's no other way that I see it. Sure. Hopefully banks will adjust a little bit in their terms so landlords can breathe a little bit, can maybe offer, uh, you know, a, a market rate rent so that actually these retailers can operate again. Uh, I'm a big fan of mom and, mom and pop shops. You know, sure. I always root for the underdog. Of course. Especially in New York. And um, I think they will be, they will be able to, to survive. And look, speaking business-wise, you know, William, on one side, it could be a bad thing because they might have to close, so speaking. But on the opposite side, it could be a good thing because if you go rent another, another space, then you're going to get, you know, on, on the good wave, right. you're going to rent at a cheaper price. I have restaurant owners that I'm telling me, Alex, I don't care. I'm going to take my kitchen out. I'm going to go to other places. They don't do the, the rent that I want. So, you know, I think that's to put it very simply. Sure. But I think that's what we're going to be seeing in the next uh, probably three to 18 months. Okay. Um, no, yeah, I, you know, because I'm with you. I'm, I do want to see the mom and pop store thrive, especially in your right. neighborhood. You don't want them to, you know, to go out of business. But obviously, right. you know, you got you to gotta understand whether it's the rent that's too high for them or they don't have enough capital reserves that might hurt them. Um, the office market. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Alex, I was seeing CNBC yeah. right. and they had someone on that was talking about the office market. And he said, I want to see what you, your take on this. Yep. Um, yep. He, he was saying that he sees a reduction of his workforce by 20%. In other words, those 20% of the people in his office will work right. from home. Cause he says that he saw a, a uptick um, production. He saw people uh, working more, doing more things at home because a they either have a you know a, a loved one at home they want to be with, or they have a newborn kid or something, but they were working longer too. He says instead of the typical eight hours, some of these people were working nine, ten, eleven hours, 
because they were being more productive because they're at home. Do you see that maybe a little bit of wave of the future where the office market might take a little, a little, um, a little, you know, might get hurt a little bit? Yes. Um, uh, I tell you what I think. And, you know, this is a little bit of a crystal ball. Of course, there's a lot of talking right now about the office, working from home. Sure. WF, uh, FH, as they call it, whatever. Um, I tend to be a little bit less shaken in my mind mm-hmm. when I think about the long term of real estate. Right. I don't think it's go- everybody's going to be working from home. I do not. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're working from home for many, many sectors and within many companies, even larger corporations, there are certain things, in my opinion, that you can sort of have working from home. But if you were to ask me, if you ask me in, in one year, half of the staff will be working from home. Right. I don't believe that, especially in five years going on. So I think that, yes, some people and some officers will be designed in a more, um, you know, in a way that would adjust more towards the market. Right. But I don't see, apart from now that everybody is a, a little bit old, you know, all over the place, doesn't know what to do, right? The next people are going back to the office. I think the truth will be somewhat in the, in the middle, in the middle. Okay. where maybe 20% less, you know, occupancy. I think companies will start thinking, okay, who could, who can work from home within the company? And I also think that um, employees on the other end would also maybe pick a job based upon the flexibility that they have yeah. If they have to work from home or if they have to go to the office. And I think it's going to be also a leverage key for the hiring process, truthfully, meaning employers that are actually going to be able to offer, you know, that opportunity might have, uh, have uh, an advantage. But I do not think that right now, I think everything is very extremized, so to speak. Sure. I don't think in the next three, four years, uh, think will be as, as aggressive and as, as, you know, Office will not be gone. Absolutely. I don't oh, yeah, I agree there. Gone. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and so right now I think we're a little bit seeing what happens. But I think people are, are also quick to forget, right? right. And now there's a problem with the pandemic. But I, I always look at human behaviors and the reason why people want to get together, the reason why people want to be in big cities, the reason why employers want to have people working close to them. Maybe you can share something. I mean, I see the real estate business. God forbid, you know, you're, you, you, you're not together. You can't pass that teammanship. You can't pass the lead that yeah. you wouldn't know if you're not from the office. You don't know what's going on. So there's, there's a lot of things you can do virtually. I don't think everything you can do virtually. And I think the office will survive. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think, I think uh, you might have a few people, like you said, may, maybe work from home or, you know, em, or employees saying to myself, hey, do I have to, like you just said, let me have the flexibility. I could do four days in the office, one day at home or three, two, whatever. Um, is, is your business New York based or do you cover other parts of the country? Um, good, good question. Yeah. So my business is New York based. We're based in Midtown Manhattan. However, we cover different markets, mainly the Miami market. Okay. okay? Los Angeles market, especially on the luxury residential and retail level on both sides, Los Angeles and Miami. Mm-hmm. We also cover the Hamptons here in New York. Okay. Um, and uh, those are the main um, markets that we cover domestically. Yeah. Uh, as far as buyers and sellers, uh, we've done, you know, on a project basis, also other, other cities like Boston, like Chicago, Philadelphia. Uh, but mainly I would say New York, Miami, Los Angeles is the one that we're most, most active in. And okay. again, going back to the reverse engineering, that's what our clients are asking for most. And that's also what our sellers are asking for most as far as the uh, type of buyers. So it seems to be that that's, yeah, that's where we go. Right. You know, and one thing that I noticed about your company is that, you know, you did attract foreign investors and clients. How did, how did that happen? Where you have 50% domestic and 50% foreign investors and clients. How did, how did you... Right. We're able to work that because that's amazing that you have clientele from all over the world. Look, we try and have a healthy business, and also we try and satisfy our client needs, right? Right. And the simple answer to that is really relationship built over time. We work a lot, for example, with banks. Okay, we work a lot with attorneys' office. Okay, we work with uh, consulting firms. Okay, we work with CPA firms. So we 
um, I've always uh, chosen in my business the, the power of relationship. And I'd rather work with somebody for a long term in sure. your business. And actually, when you have something on the market, know already who you're going to sell it to. Yeah. Versus, you know, we, we, we touched upon briefly before, William. Um, you know, in 2020, let's say you're a seller in New York, right? And you want to sell your penthouse apartment or an apartment in general, right? Everybody from the firm that has one person to the firm that has 4,000 person, you're going to put it on the same listing site, okay? Mm -hmm. They are going to be on the same listing site. What sellers want to know is what are you going to do above that? Okay, how are you going to sell it, you know, that, okay, tell me something I don't know. So I know that a lot of companies are pitching on the technology, the proprietary side, and right. this and that, and it's great. You know, I, I believe in all of that, but ultimately I see that relationship and being able to tap on different markets. For example, now with the pandemic, it was a global pandemic, right? First time that the whole world shut down, arguably speaking, right? You could right. say that, you could argue that. But now we see different waves where, you know, Asia is, is back first. Europe, so to speak, is back second. America was touched third, right? And then South America now is last. Right. So I have European investors that are telling me, okay, Alex, when are we buying, right? So they are ready already to, to, to get things moving. So that's been always, you know, a way for us to conduct a healthy business, a way to provide a valuable service and clients to our local market that sure. looks for more than the price. And um, and again, this is what we've been doing. We've been doing for uh, how how we organically run the business. Yeah, and it's important because I I definitely want to touch base on that because obviously you built the team over the years, and it's right. and it's all about relationships. So when the, when you met these people, were these people uh, a combination of networking events? Uh, people introduced you to these people. Like how was the how was the initial contact made? All of the above, right? Okay. I think I think before that, the main question is, I see, again, I see a lot of value in relationship. But I'll give an example. Some people do a lot of marketing, okay? Yes. And then when you do a lot of marketing, what happens? You pay per lead and people don't know you and you're on a mass business. I never chose to go down that route because to me, the person that runs with me today, in two years, is going to run something bigger. In five years, he's going to buy yeah uh, an apartment in 10 years gonna buy a penthouse and a townhouse so i've i've, I've realized that if you have patience in your long-term goal yeah. you're able to build a business that is actually built in an organic way that when something like the pandemic happens or all this stuff happens we are the one that fare the best because we never over leveraged ourselves right we never you know built a business that was exploding to begin with and then it just needed a, a thing to, to crash and um, I met all these people, you know, in, in, in all different places. I mean, even the, the agents that I, that I hire now, you know, I have a boutique team of uh, six people, okay? And I'm looking to hire four more by September. So we mm -hmm. go to 10. Um, and uh, I met, the way I hire agents, to give you an example, it's by, most of the agents I hired by deals that I've done in the past and they were with other firms. And that for me is the best way to see how you're going to work with somebody sure. versus doing an interview that, you know, there's another person or LinkedIn, they reach out. So I have a very one-on-one -on -one practical approach to business that uh, has, worked, has worked out, you know, uh, not for you. No, that's good. I mean, like I said, and you said it, it's all about relationships, building whatever you can. And then from there, you hope that, you know, it could cultivate into a good working relationship. So for you, Alex, what's the, what's the future plans for the Karini group? Like, what are you looking to do, you know, uh, in the next six months, year, or even if that's too far out, maybe the next couple of weeks? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Look, I think you have to have short-term goals and you have to right. have long-term long goals. So two things um, are the future plans for me and for my company. One is going to be definitely geographical expansion, where, right. as I mentioned to you, we currently are in New York, in, um, in Miami, in Los Angeles. Uh, we are considering opening an office in Milan, in Italy. Right. We have a lot of clients you know, from there, and yeah. also London, okay? Uh -huh. Consider the, the capital of Europe, so to speak. Right. And that's gonna be first. 
and then expanding ultimately to Hong Kong and Dubai to have the larger cities because we work a lot with Asians and uh, and Middle East. So that's the geographical expansion that I would say that would be the second wave, uh, Hong Kong and Dubai. Sure. And and number two, on a vertical integration um, aspect, we are going to get into the development side of of the business, uh, mainly offering projects and uh, and private equity investment really to the clients that were already servicing it, but more on a, on a project uh, level where there's some upside and then people want to be part of the project. And uh, that's going to be also in the next, uh, already working on some stuff. I don't know if nice. I can, you know. Uh, that's up to you. If you want to say it, sure. If not, you know, I understand. Yeah, <laughs> I, I will give the general idea, but sure. yeah, that's definitely private, private investment for real estate. And, um, and uh, oh, I'd be one of the investors. Okay. <laughs> later. Um, but the development side, absolutely something that we, in the next three years we're going to develop heavily. And, uh, and I think it's great in New York. I think New York is going through a great time for that type of business. No, I, I agree. I mean, there's building, I mean, there's, to me, it seems like every few blocks you see some new type of construction. And so that, so you'll not only have the residential side and then the commercial side, but you also have a development side. So that'd be the third arm of the Carini group uh, in the future. Yeah, exactly. The idea is, you know, I, I see this not to be horizontally expanded, meaning sure. I don't want a company with 3000 agents and be in the mass business, sure. but I still want to keep it uh, effective, but integrated vertically with brokerage and development yeah. and also have uh, satellite you know presence in the market that we actually do cover and that our clients are interested in absolutely yes. no that sounds good well listen alex i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to peer-to-peer -peer real estate i really appreciate it so if anybody wants to get in contact with you what's the best way um email alex at carini group.com phone number 917-833-4388 and also i would say uh, all social media at Karini Group, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. Right. All of the above works, uh, depending on if it's something immediate or if it's something to stay in touch. Sometimes social media is great to see what you're up to and and uh, and and we're there for the long term. Right. Sounds good. Well, listen again, Alex. Thank you so much. It, it was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure seeing you again after so many months. And hopefully, in the future, we see each other in person. Uh, you know, at, at either some networking event. <laughs> I think very, very soon. I think things are going to come back very strong very soon. Thank you, William, for having me in your great podcast. I heard it having terrific success. So I'm very honored and thank you. For well, that. no, thank you. Thank it's, you. It's guests like you that make the podcast great. So it's not <laughs> me, it's you. So Alex, very again, kind. thank you so much, buddy. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Be well and take care of yourself. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, everyone, that was Alex Carini from CariniGroup.com. That's C-A-R-I-N-I Group.com. Alex, thank you so much for being on today's Peer to Peer Real Estate Show. Really, really appreciate it. You can find me at Peer to Peer Real Estate.com. That's Peer, the number two, Peer Real Estate.com. Check out our past show, our blog, and our resource page. Also, we're going to be looking to update the website sometime either in July or August. I'm excited about that, and I'll let you guys know when that happens. Also, if you guys go to Apple Podcasts, Please look for us on Peter Peer Real Estate Podcast. Please subscribe to your review. Tell us how we can make this show better. And before I go, before I go, guys, there's a couple more things. Do not give up on your dreams. Fight for it. Protect it. Guard it. Don't let anyone talk you out of it. And I really believe keep the momentum going. Good things will happen. Anyway, on behalf of Peter Peer Real Estate, I'm Willie Morales. Until next time, thanks, everybody, and please stay safe. Bye.